Hi folks, I'm just doing part two here of the Revival to Come. I said that I would do a series on the Revival to Come based on the uh, prophecies, dreams, visions, particularly around the early 90s, my mid-20s, about a great revival to come that would come across the UK and across the nations. Um, I shared in part one about a um, spiritual drought, about prophesying about a drought in the nation. You know, there was 1989 to 92, the weather reports and things about that drought and that I was prophesying regularly about God raising up you know, a, a army of prayers during a time of spiritual drought and yet rain would come and you know during that time I'd be prophesying you know so often about you know uh, barrenness infertility desert drought and yet God wanting to restore rain birthing a time of restoration to come an outpouring of his Holy Spirit to come and so I was sharing last time about some of it in rhyme about you know the prophetic prayerful proper prideless people to come an army of prayers rising up in a time of spiritual drought um, I was talking about 2 Chronicles 7 14 ultimately that you know impacts or uh, unwraps 2 Chronicles 7 14 if only my people who are called by my name will humble themselves prideless pray prayerful seek my face prophetic and turn from their wicked ways proper then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal the land. And I was talking about the context of 2 Chronicles 7.13. When I shut up the heavens, when there's no rain, that's when that people rise up. So you know, there's that sense of spiritual drought across the nations that God wanted to pour out rain. So I was sharing that prophecy there. You know, God stirring us up to be an army of prayers. And during the, that time, you know, I was having so many dreams, visions, prophecies, rhyme about uh, an outpouring to come. One of the features was that there would be rain. And I, I remember just reading again and again, 1 Kings 17, 1 Kings 18, about the story of Elijah. Elijah steps up and says that, you know, to Ahab, there'll be no rain in the land. We hear, you know, that... I um, mean, 1 Kings 18, in the third year, he comes and he um, presents himself, you know, um, announcing to King Ahab to summon the false prophets under Mount Carmel. So we hear it around the third year. And then in Luke 4, 25, and in James 5, we read about um, Elijah was a prayer. And for about, you know, three and a half years, there was no rain on the land. And so I have this increasing feeling that God was going to restore rain with actual physical rain was going to come and I remember reading you know in 1 Kings 17 18 just again and again um reading the likes of Psalm 126 about you know streams flowing in the Negev and you know Zechariah 10 1 ask the Lord for rain and it will be given you know and the Hosea 10 12 about um, sowing for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love for it's time to break up the unplowed ground until he showers righteousness upon you. And so these scriptures felt like there was going to be actual physical rain, not just spiritual drought or spiritual rain, that's the promise of God, spiritual rain, but there will be a sign of a great outpouring of rain. And so in March 1992, I felt myself prophesying, writing rhyme, then prophesying, you know, this this word of, of rhyme, which some of you may have heard, which I'll unpack a little bit more. With my word to fill the hands, the hands that go to till these lands, with these hands to till and to toil, to beat those plowshares and to break this soil. From this land to bring my fire, word, will and way bring my desire, for with this fire I'll sweep this land, unholy feet they cannot stand. They cannot stand, they do not know, they have no root, they cannot grow. But sow that seed, now sow in tears. That's a, it's that perfect love drives out all fears. The fears to fall, the fears to go, the strongholds drop and the waters flow. Now see the clouds gather, six times, six times not there. Now see at the seventh, 
the showers they bear. So ask the Lord, Lord, send that flood to immerse this nation, yet save its blood. Ask the Lord, Lord, send that shower with its life-giving rain and salvation power. Ask the Lord, Lord, send that water to save those who fall before the false prophet slaughter. And ask the Lord, Lord, send the rain to feed the seed and raise the grain. For with my word to fill the hands, the hands that go to till these lands, with these hands to till and to toil, to beat those plowshares and to break this soil. And what I was prophesying, there was those various passages about God taking um, particularly the, the UK from a place of drought into a great outpouring of spiritual rain. And so it references you know, much about 1 Kings 18 and a people, first of all, the people praying, you know, about, you know, tilling, um, tilling the land with God's word, filling our hands, the hands that go to till these lands. And God there saying about beating plowshares to break the soil. So raising up a praying people. And then his promise, you know, to bring his fire upon this land, you know, a, a fresh outpouring, a great outpouring of the rain to come. So there's an image there of his fire, the Holy Spirit to come, and ultimately, obviously, the rain to come. Um, the prophecy there references, you know, the, the need to evangelise, you know, the need to sow that seed, and sow in tears compassion and evangelism, and, and letting God's perfect love drive out fears. So the need to pray, there's the sense of the need to walk with God, the need to pass the message on to unbelievers, and then it's God's role to uh, pour out his rain, that it's God's role that the fears will fall, the strongholds drop, and the waters flow. So I feel like God's saying, you know, there's a an army of prayers to rise up like Elijah, who will pray, walk in his ways, who will be speaking of God to the nation, and then God promising that rain, that prophesying about, you know, a flood, the spiritual flood, the spiritual water, and saving those, um, you know, who fall before the false prophets slaughter. In 1 Kings 18, the false prophets get killed. And there's a, an image there of God breaking the false prophets, breaking the false voices across this nation as we pray, as we walk with him, you know, him breaking the false prophets, the false voices uh, before the outpouring of rain. And then ultimately God's promised, you know, sending that, that flood, that shower, that water, that rain to feed the seed and raise the grain. So, you know, a people of prayer, walking in his ways, you know, speaking out the message in love. And then it's God who will break those strongholds, those fears and pour out the spiritual rain upon the land. And so, you know, prophesying that in March 1992, and I, I think I referenced last time I've been watching the weather over the preceding years and how the, it had been talked about the, the drought the, in different places of the UK, the worst in 40, 80, 100 years and I referenced uh, I think the Independent and some of its uh, headlines there. So I was prophesying this and then April 1992 there was this massive rain you know, which in those days it, you know the weather reports were Worst floods in up to 200 years across the UK and you know, that sense of God wanting to restore the spiritual rain. I remember reading The Independent, it's the 30th of April 1992. This month is already the wettest April across the UK in records dating back a century to 1910 according to provisional figures from the Met Office. And then The Independent, just the paper I got hold of, 1st of May 1992. First the drought and then the wettest April in history. And there was a, a rundown of the various millimetres of rain. So I feel like God you know, was, was wanting to pour out a, a, an immense revival on the nation. And let's just look a little bit at 1 Kings 17 and 18. So, you know, Elijah prophesies a drought. And so his... We will know a little bit about that story, perhaps if you read 1 Kings 17 and 18. He prophesies this drought in 1 Kings 17 and, and 18. He prophesies the drought in 17. And then there's the story of 1 Kings 18, how he presents himself to Ahab. And he's then, he then goes to Ahab in the third year and he challenges 
Ahab um, about the sending of rain. Um, you know, God speaks to Elijah, says, go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. There's going to be a break and a promise of rain on the land. And we, we read in verse 18 that um, Elijah's challenge to Ahab and to the nation at the time is that you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. And he challenges Ahab to summon the false prophets, the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah. And there's this phrase that he uses, which is like almost a statement across the UK, and it could be used to other nations as well. Verse 21, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And so they, they gather the prophets of Asherah and Baal. They, there's a, almost that challenge to the nation of the UK, are you, so are you going to follow God? Are you not going to follow God? There are false prophets, false voices going out, you know, deterring people, pulling away people from the Lord. And yet we know the story that Elijah then rebuilds an altar. And the first thing I want to flag up is that I believe God is raising up a church like Elijah, whose name means the Lord is God. So everything he does points to God. That's what he's about. We understand he's a praying person. We read that, you know, in, in the context of the likes of 1 Kings 17 and 18. We read about it in James 5, you're aware. We read about how he's a fervent prayer. So he, he's a prayer. Um, he, his lifestyle, you know, we read again James 5, the prayer of a righteous man, a person who's getting himself right with God. And so we, we know he's walking with God. And we know he's speaking the message out. Everything is about pointing to God. It's not about the results. It's about pointing to God. The Lord is God. That's his name, Elijah. Um, the Lord is God. There's a sense, I believe, for the church UK to be, you know, the Lord is God. Everything that you do is about serving God. You know, Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this is a prophetic church of pointing to God, praying, walking in his ways. What is it to walk in his righteousness, his holiness? What is it to share with people, to speak of the goodness and the kindness of God and share the good news with the nation? Um, results belong to him. The spiritual reign belongs to him. It's him who breaks the strongholds. So first of all, he's looking for a church that will walk like Elijah, who will walk in his ways, whose name is like the Lord is God. Secondly, when we read in 1 Kings 18, we read about the repairing of an altar. So the altar has been broken down, and Elijah's challenge is that the altar be rebuilt, and first of all, the false prophets will call for fire upon the altar, and then Elijah himself will call for fire upon the altar. And so we can read in 1 Kings 18 how the false prophets, you know, you know, try calling for fire to their God, but he, you know, Elijah is taunting them, you know, he, he's not answering. And so that, that's why ultimately the false prophets are came, taken and slaughtered because no fire came. But now Elijah steps forward. It's Elijah's turn. And so we see a rebuilding of an altar. So God looking for a church like Elijah, but a church like this altar. I feel like God's Rebuilding this altar, we need to participate with the rebuilding of the altar. So Elijah takes the 12 stones, each one representing a tribe of Israel. And so there's a sense of the unity. What is it to be unified as a church, to walk in the unity of the gospel, you know, the good news of Jesus Christ? So there's an altar that he builds here that has a, um, a breadth, a depth, and a length. It's like it's, I feel like there's an intercessory church between God and the nation. What will this intercessor be like? The breadth of the church. So it's going to be a breadth of church, breadth of kingdom involvement, breadth of different streams, you know, flowing together, learning to get on with one another. And particularly, you know, um, the likes of Psalm 133, how God wants to pour out his blessing on unity. So we need to be as one with, with one another. 
and there's that sense of the word and the spirit across that breadth as well you know, um, in Ephesians 6 you know it talks about the sword of the spirit is the word of God so we need the word of God and we need the spirit of God you know both those dynamics at work you know knowing and walking with the scriptures but you know the Holy Spirit alive in us with us and through us and that across the breadth of the church so seeking the unity of the church I'm reminded of uh, Smith Wigglesworth's prophecy of 1947 about the word and the spirit coming together uh, before a great revival upon the UK and the, the, the nation. So how do we step into that? Honouring, respecting, working with those who want to stand for the gospel. And then the depth. There's a depth to this altar that Elijah builds. It's that sense of 12, completion, unity, breadth, but now a depth. I feel like there's the depth of ministry, different types of ministry, honouring and working together. You know, in Ephesians 4, 11, it talks about the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. And it's God's design that the church is apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral and teaching. And therefore, you know, different ministries honouring one another and us, each one of us, honouring different ministries that are part of God's church part of the fullness that he is building and releasing so we need to honor one another honor those different ministries there are folks i believe who are apostolic have the ability to pioneer even you know in signs wonders and miracles but have a, have a pioneering ability that we need to honor and work with there are those that are more prophetic and bring revelation to the church so we can step into more of God's presence and perhaps leading us in worship and prayer and praise and things. There are those who are gifted with the evangelistic and help us to step into how to reach the lost. And, and there are those who are pastoral and teaching and help us to step into how to live for God, how to live in his ways and how to understand scripture. And we see when these ministries work together in you know, the likes of Acts 13, the prophets and teachers are praying, that's Barnabas and, and Saul um, and the, the other prophets and teachers there. And when they get working together, we see this great Antioch church that comes out of that moment. So what is it to have the breadth of the church? What is it to have the depth of the ministry? And then there's a length to this altar. And I call that the length of communication, the intercessory length, which I've already mentioned, are people who live for God from his presence, you know, know how to walk with him and are speaking to others, sharing with others, that intercessory role of going between God and man. So Elijah rebuilds this altar and eventually he prays. So we're looking for a church like Elijah who walks in the Lord is God. Elijah rebuilds an altar. It's an altar I believe that is the church in unity, a breadth of the church, a depth of ministry, a length of communication, people wanting to come out of God's presence, walk with him and speaking to the nation. And eventually you know, we, we read in 1 Kings 18, you know, well, that um, Elijah he actually pours 12 jars of water on this altar. So that, again, that 12, that completion, a complete amount of water. Again, the water is a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Physically, this is a time of drought, so really using up the resources. You know, that four jars, three times, 12 jars of water being poured upon the altar. You know, real dependence upon God for fire to come if this is this altar is going to be wet and so we see that fullness of water and the the altar itself is a symbol of the altar of burnt offering so the altar of burnt offering was in the tabernacle the burnt offering was the only offering that was totally consumed of the offerings that went upon that altar there are various offerings fellowship offerings there was uh, the sin offering but the burnt offering was an offering of complete devotion and so Paul talks about this you know, as we have it in the tabernacle when we read in the book of Exodus but Paul refers to it in Romans 12 1 to 2 um, he, he says therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices and um, holy and pleasing to God this is your spiritual act of worship 
do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And he's imploring people to put their lives on the altar fully for God, that he might then, um, you know, that we might then be transformed and step more into knowing his will, knowing his ways and seeing your God move in our lives. So there's an image here of the altar burnt offering where you know, the burnt offering was a symbol of God's devotion, complete devotion to his people as symbolised in the cross, you know, Jesus giving himself up fully, but then a symbol of God's devotion to God, of, of yeah, the people's devotion to God. Sorry. And so God's looking to, I believe, to build an altar, a breadth, a depth, a length of communication, that he's preparing it in a time when resources will really depend upon him. When he's asking us to put our, our lives like the altar of burnt offering, you know, our lives on the altar, devotion and commitment to him, that he might send a a Pentecostal type fire. Because that's there's also that image as well. You know, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit poured out upon that gathered group of people in the who came from the upper room have been gathered in the upper room 120 disciples and many people you know drawn thousands of people drawn into the kingdom on that day so what is it to be a church in unity what is it to be a church with the breadth the, of, of church the depth of ministry that length of communication that intercessory church who will devote ourselves to god you know, knowing that we're dependent upon him for his resources, knowing that it's him who sends the fire. And I think we read in verse 36, you know, Elijah is saying, I've walked in your ways. I've done all these things at your command. It's not just a prayer. I've done all these things at your command. And then this phenomenal prayer for revival. Answer us, Lord. Um, answer us, or answer me, says Elijah. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. What a great prayer for revival. Answer us, oh Lord, answer us so that these people will know that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. So again, this praying people, God, raise up a church who believes that the Lord is God and we're walking in his ways, praying, walking in his ways, speaking to a people where an altar is rebuilt, and that Lord you will send fire and we, we see in 1 Kings 18 the fire falls so uh, Elijah is vindicated you're the Lord is God and here's this incredible moment the fire falls and the people who are standing around who've been summoned to Mount Carmel they start saying the Lord he is God the Lord he is God and this is a play on words of the name of Elijah. Elijah's name means the Lord is God. You know, Elijah, the word Yah is, is in there. You're referencing Yahweh. The Lord is God. So he, his name is Elijah. And now the people use a phrase, the Lord is God. And it's symbolic of Elijah's name, but also crying out to God. And I feel like Father's saying that He's raising up a church like Elijah, rebuilding the altar for the fire to fall, where people looking on as the strongholds in the nation are being turned, who they will start to cry out, you know, the Lord is God, but also the church, something is happening in the church. Yeah, the church is the answer. You know, so there on that day, Elijah is hearing people crying out to God, but he's also hearing a reference to his name as they fall prostrate. And they're even starting to evangelise one another. The Lord is God. And so we have this outpouring of fire. You know, the people falling and crying out, the Lord is God. They're referencing something about Elijah, the Lord is God. And you know, I believe a Father wants to send a revival where it will sweep through the people, sweep through the people of the nation as we... Uh, Walk with him as we walk with you know, the Lord is God, pointing to him, rebuilding that altar. 
calling upon him for fire. Answer us, O oh, answer us, oh God, that these people know that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again, that they will cry out, the Lord is God, and that they will actually see something about the church, whatever that is, the church, the church. There's something about this group of people, these Christians that we, we need to be alongside and learn from. And so that's what I feel the Father's saying about rebuilding of that altar. And then Elijah sends his servant for um, to, to look for rain. Elijah bends down into this intercessory position of praying for rain. And he sends his servant Gehazi to look for rain. And in scripture, clouds again and again are associated with, with God. Jesus coming on the clouds, Jesus ascending on a cloud, the cloud that the um, Israelites have in the desert, the cloud of God going before them. The cloud is a symbol and picture of God's presence. And Gehazi you know, goes and sees, you know, six times there isn't a cloud, but the seventh time, is, seventh time he goes, he sees this hand, this cloud as small as a man's hand, and it's heavy with rain. And those are the days we're living in. You know, God's saying, you know, now see the clouds gather six times, not there. Now see at the seventh, the showers they bear. So let's be praying you know, for that rain, because then follows this heavy rain that comes down in, on the nation. As we read at the end of 1 Kings 18, um, he sends uh, Gehazi, and let me, let me just read, Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain started falling. And that's the rain that we want to see upon our nation and then upon the nations. So, so quite a lot, a lot there, but I'm just unpacking that second part of the revival, the rain to come. God raising up a, an army of praise in the time of spiritual, spiritual drought with a great you know, sense of spiritual rain to come. God calling a people like Elijah to walk as the Lord is God. God calling a people to rebuild the altar, the breadth of the church, the word and the spirit, the depth of the church, ministries working together, honouring together and us honouring those ministries. An intercessory church that knows God's presence, prays, walks with him, speaks to the nation and Praying God, Lord, send the fire, fire and rain, both symbols of God's spirit, dependent upon his resources, that a Pentecostal style of Acts 2 type further outpouring, particularly upon the UK, with the uh, rain to come. And, you know, just re referencing back to that prophecy and seeing in April 1992, this outpouring of rain, which was the worst in up to 200 years in different areas so i hope that's helpful uh, folks you know get back to me ask questions about that but let's get stirred up about praying for a great revival upon the uk and upon the nations